Okay, very good. Very glad to be speaking to you all. Um, so I wanted to get just give some background to what ICRAF's been doing with the private sector. Uh, I have a little less information on C4, but I'll be talking about C4 ICRAF subsequently. So we adopted a private sector engagement policy in 2014, and the private sector was very important to us. And at the time, we were the leading CGIR center working with the private sector. It, the private sector funding constituted about 9% of our budget, and it was mostly or almost entirely from Mars Incorporated uh, for the work that we were doing improving COCO in Cote d'Ivoire. And initially, because uh, I, I was there and I remember the discussions, we saw the private sector largely as a source of funding for us and was a way to diversify our funding away just from bilaterals and the big donors. And just as a point of interest, I looked this up. Um, I looked up what the CGR is doing right now, or one CGR as well, uh, with the private sector. And I found a report that came out uh, in April called CGIR Open for Business, which is all about their approach to the private sector. And their number one thing is expected benefits of private sector engagement. And nature or nature-based solutions are, are completely not mentioned in, in the report at all. But we wanted uh, private sector money for funding, but also because we hoped we would help them do better what they were doing, you know, manage watersheds better. Uh, and, and I also personally hope to get some scale out of it because we knew that they were working with many, many um, smallholders. And we had a good presentation this morning from Dietmar and Shui and George about inclusive business models. So this has been around for a while. Um, and, and the last figure I was able to get was that uh, funding as a percentage of the aircraft budget in 2020 was 16%. I wasn't able to get uh, anything further. Oh, okay, I'm on, yeah, okay, I'm doing two things here. Um, uh, it's been good working with the private sector and we have a whole long background at aircraft uh, and also at C4, but Ramney's right in front of me and we had the Alan Black here margarine uh, story, story. For those who don't know, Alan Black here is a massive um, pod with very big seeds inside of it, which produces a, a, an oil that can be used as margarine. We worked a little bit with Himalaya, the cosmetic company in India. Uh, we heard yesterday from Leigh about uh, their work with Danone on the watershed. Um, that's Danone's private, um, not private, um, water bottling company. Nothing to do with yogurt in that particular one in Indonesia. Also Asian pulp and paper in Indonesia. And Natura, uh, that's where Andrew Nicholas has got a huge um, relationship with them. Um, they're, they own the body shop. I think they're the largest company in the world dealing with um, personal products. And then obviously we've had all the cocoa uh, companies like Semwa, Barakabo, and then Sola is bringing in uh, uh, large organizations, uh, entities like HSBC and Temasek for carbon, which is something we weren't even thinking about in 2014. And C4 aircraft really welcomes RL, Resilient Landscapes. It's really a major addition to our repertoire and our skill set uh, because working with the private sector requires very specific skills and experience, a lot of fluency in things like deal making and, and familiarity with things like financing and debt. The first time I met Nitin, I think was in 2016 in Mumbai, when he was working for Yes Bank, and he was trying to set up a green bond for the um, Western Ghats. Um, and Resilient Landscapes has also brought uh, and appreciated an explicit piv pivot to nature-based solutions, which is great. And nature-based solutions are now part of our DNA. And I again checked in with our C4 aircraft strategy for the next 10 years or the next eight years. It doesn't actually mention nature-based solutions. I, I checked, but it refers to working with nature as one of our values. So today is a really good opportunity to discuss all this. And what I have to say as a human being and a personal person and Kathy Watson is I approach this with guarded optimism. And you all know Antonio Gramsci's famous statement, optimism of the will, pessimism of the intellect. Mm -hmm. I think it's really hard working with the private sector, um, but we absolutely have to do it. And hashtag, we don't have time. We have, to, we have to sort them out. We have to sort the world out and so on and so forth. And we're so concerned about uh, poverty and justice and inequality in the environment. So obviously the private sector is like under great pressure. And for those of you who don't know, and I follow this really closely, there's pending draft regulations in the EU 
uh, about seven products that cause deforestation and forest degradation from entering the EU block. Um, and those are soya, beef, oil, palm, coffee, cocoa, timber, some derived projects, products and cattle. Um, uh, and the private sector, so the private sector is actually panicking in West Africa when you meet them about cocoa and what to do um, because uh, the EU imports 60% of the world's uh, cocoa. And the private sector also desperately needs to reduce its carbon footprint, uh, decarbonize. They want and need carbon credits. I'm, con I'm continually being told by carbon companies that it's a seller's market and we should be taking advantage of this. And I think we're going to be with some of these big projects that um, have been coming in. And people don't want bad carbon credits now, or many, many organizations don't. They want really quality ones with biodiversity in there. The shocking truth is that most carbon credits go for basically eucalyptus plantations still in the world. Um, and people are looking for really quality um, um, assemblages of, of, of carbon inside the credit and also biodiversity credits. And then, of course, some want to climate proof the watersheds they depend upon. And we have things like the Nairobi Water Fund, which Coca-Cola puts in a measly $100,000 into. But the argument being that we have to maintain the Abaderas, otherwise these big uh, drinks companies won't have clean water. Um, but I ha have to say, and this is where I'm skeptical, they're pretty mingy about what they put in. And it's all still very dependent upon um, other sorts of financing. So basically, it's no easy walk to resources for sea for aircraft with the private sector, uh, no matter how good you are at partnerships. And many companies simply are not part of this conversation. And I'm really glad that we can have this conversation. I was horrified to see an enormous rice factory right inside a Ramsar wetland on the fringes of Lake Victoria. It's actually there illegally. This is not a, an uncommon thing to see. And even companies with large sustainability units are defensive only seeing part of the picture, slow to move. And I encountered this when I wrote a piece about deforestation in the cashew growing areas in Cote d'Ivoire. I was contacted by many, many companies, including the largest uh, aggregator in the uh, commodity aggregator in the world. And they were saying, how did you see this? How do you know this? And they were really in a panic. Um, and I really hope that they soon, um, well, anyway, I hope that they um, come up with something, some funding so that we can actually help them to think around what's going on up there because their footprint, um, although they bring money into the area, um, the, the footprint is not sustainable or the impact's not sustainable. And I also see companies really not interested in using their own funds. I had a conversation with Barry Calbo about we really need to get our act together on what species are being used in cocoa agroforestry because there's a whole uh, array, array of them. And they said, well, maybe we could put in $50,000. And actually it's a huge it's a huge thing to get that sorted out and to sort out the seed sources. Cote d'Ivoire doesn't really even have a, pro a fully fledged tree One seed minute center. Left, ah, okay, I'll go really, really fast. Um, oh, but I do now, they want public funds. Um, they're not pursuing things like uh, biocircular economies. And they just don't understand largely why we need biodiversity. It, you know, it's not just furry things. It's keeping um, ecosystems and agriculture going and, and uh, you know, pollinators and all that. So we have a big role. We have to do a lot of awareness raising. We need to win the confidence of companies. It's really slow work. And I think it's interesting that so far, quite a few of the projects that uh, Resilient Landscapes is working on actually arise out of projects where we've had people like Andrew Nicholas have had you know, a decade of work with on the subject with the company. Um, and then just finally, I was in Ethiopia last week. I went to see the Amhara Forestry um, Enterprise. And the DG said to me, uh, if you ask the private sector to invest in tree seed, they're not interested uh, because it just takes too long. And they praised our particular our project there, which is investing in breeding seed orchards. Um, and that's a uh, breeding seed orchard of Hagenia abyssinica and with our colleague, um, Abraham Abia. Um, and this is a private tree and fodder seed company in Addis. I don't know whether uh, Nitin and all at Stefan, it would be an interesting thing to try and help them scale to areas where there are no uh, possibly bringing in private equity. And then just a shout out for Christine Labana, who is working on something that looks like an MBS to me, but it's the agrivoltaics, and it's it's um, you know it's obviously uh, a business um, opportunity. So thanks very much.